Hey, it's Jay from the Table Gaming, and today we're joined by Michael Chanel, Director of Game Design at Simon Games, and solo designer on Deceased, the latest entry into the Zombie Side franchise. Michael, thanks so much for coming on. Hello, Chase. Always good to see you again. All right, so this is a really exciting one here. I think uh, getting to dive into the, the world of Deceased, of which I did pick up a copy of and uh, read through. Boy, that was it's a little a little grim in there. So kind of a tonal shift here for uh, for some of the Zombie Sides. Um, you, so, uh, you just have the first issue of Deceased, not the I, all the follow ups. I only I only got through that one first, and it was uh, it was jarring. I, I, for those that haven't followed along, the uh, some there's some there's some significant deaths early on. I started flipping through. Oh, maybe it's a spoiler territory, but um, I mean, but I'll it, straight up say it. You know, Batman dies in the first like 15 pages, and that's to me the smartest <laughs> decision they could have done with that series, is because otherwise he's just going to fix the problem. And that's not even right. really spoilers. I mean, look at the cover. So, Michael, what makes Deceased unique compared to uh, maybe other games in the Zombicide series? So, of course, Deceased is based on its namesake comic book from, you know, DC Comics, a little known, uh, you know, indie startup company here. <laughs> um, and, you know, that is basically the major inspiration to what you are seeing in the game. But uh, as I have mentioned in previous, you know, talks, that is only the base inspiration. You know, we're basically pulling from everything we can in the entirety of DC Comics that we thought was cool. Because the DC story is very focused, and yes, it has um, expansions and, well, sorry, I guess they would call those like follow-ups and, you know, not so much expansions, um, trailing different superhero groups and everything that happens. But we basically wanted to incorporate, you know, everything we could that was cool about DC, while still, of course, maintaining the baseline that everything is based on the DC comic, deceased comics. That's going to become a problem during this interview is DC <laughs> versus deceased so essentially what that means in a roundabout way is that while the comics are the foundation, we're not necessarily limiting ourselves to just that. So we will have characters and some scenarios, areas, events, and things like that that are in DC, but not necessarily in deceased. Although that lays the foundation for everything. So all the rules that they set up to how things work, that's what we're abiding by. Okay. So, you know, uh, when you come to a property like deceased and you have the larger kind of DC universe, what are some of the challenges and opportunities that uh, that brings with it, right? When you have to adapt the, the DC comic storyline into a tabletop game. One of the biggest ones is the fact that we are dealing with superheroes and a lot of them are people's absolute favorites and they've been around for, you know, almost a hundred years in some cases, there's a lot to draw from. So, you know, when we're designing Batman, all right, which version of Batman are we going to be doing? And the fact that we are condensing it down into you know, these specific powers, is this going to feel like Batman? And that one's almost a little easy because you can almost not get it wrong as long as you don't give him like, you know, the twin Gats ability or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, when it comes down to like doing a lot of the other characters that are a little bit more niche or, you know, not necessarily well known, those ones, everyone, someone is everyone's favorite. And it's a matter of doing those justice to make sure that they both feel and play as the character they should. And we're not even getting to the topic of the fact that, like, you know, there might be six, seven different versions of the same character uh, being different uh, identities to that character. Like, how many Robins have there been? You know, technically, how many Batmans have there been throughout the course of the comic book run? So what you're saying is there's plenty of room for scratch goals in this game. I can run out of miniatures and that. <laughs> I mean, technically, uh, we could alone just do, like, Batman the campaign, but that's not something we did. Um, we definitely <laughs> wanted to cover, like, as big a gambit as we could. Uh, and, of course, you know, I can't talk about, you know, the specifics too terribly much, but, you know, it's a CMON Kickstarter with a giant IP. You know, we will have expansions. We will have stretch goals. One of the things I did is definitely didn't want to have too many repeats in the campaign of any front. So, you know... Like I said, we could have done the entire campaign of just the Batman. I mean, you know, they did the Batman International storyline, which just <laughs> literally was just global Batman. Um, but no, here, wanted to touch on different things from just like the obscure to the most well-known stuff. I will say, though, um, you'll see a trend very early on in the campaign, probably, of how everything links back to Deceased. Uh, as I mentioned initially, Deceased has a number of spin-off volumes, and in fact, Chase, I've got a number of them all right here if you want me to flash them on screen or anything. But, <laughs> you know, you've got Dead Planet, Unkillables, Hope at World's End. All of these are little sub-stories that follow different superhero groups or minor storylines within the overall DC, Deceased. And, you know, that is just what is um, being followed here. So when you read the comics and you see, like, oh, man, you know, this is a, a character I'm not exactly sure of, but they're really important in this storyline. They're probably going to show up in some capacity.
Well, I know from other projects you've done that I follow that you've always pride yourself on really uh, knowing the lore and doing like a deep dive, like knowing your stuff. Um, for this campaign, as you work to integrate that stuff into the game, um, you know, we've got the miniatures, which is always a, a, you know, a slam dunk. Um, but one of the cool things about uh, deceased or zombies in general is also the, the things that can be done with the tiles. Are we going to see kind of flavorful things added into the tiles? You know, are there any settings or um, uh, locales that we might be able to expect? So there are several major settings uh, in DC overall. Uh, you know, I'm sure the big ones immediately come to mind, but the core box one is focused on Metropolis, a.k.a. Superman's okay. you know, hometown. So it's, it's, and... it's themed as a whole around a location then? Yes, the core okay. box is Metropolis. Keeping note that I'm saying core box there, like there's any you know surprises there. Mm. You know there might be some other major cities and locations that you'll see that you know little known places in DC, you know wherever wherever Batman's from or whatever. But <laughs> it, when we're focused on like the core box, Batman's. you have Metropolis, and you know it's it's fun designing around that because even when it comes to the tiles, so who uh, uh, Henning Ludwigson did all the tiles like he does for a lot of our games, one of the best in the industry when it comes to really getting into making all these. But we put in as many references as we could throughout all the little tiles. So you're going to see the locations will have references to places that are in Metropolis. You know, not just necessarily the big ones, you know, like the Daily Planet or LexCorp or Wayne Tech. Um, Yes, they have a branch in Metropolis, but even the little small stuff that, you know, only maybe necessarily the diehard Superman uh, fans or the ones who actually know what they're looking at um, will actually see. Like, you know, specific nightclubs or, you know, maybe clubs that are, you know, uh, owned by supporting characters like, you know, uh, Bibbo Bib Bibowski, you know, one of my one of my <laughs> favorite gonna, just like deceased, deceased. And you're all the tongue twisters here. But sorry. <laughs> apparently, that's just a recurring theme with Superman and DC stuff. Um, but that's actually a thing to talk about as well as, you know, even just the bystanders in the box. Again, this is Metropolis theme. So you have ones, you know, of course you have like, you know, uh, Perry White and uh, Jimmy Olsen, Lois Lane, you know, the big name ones. But you also have the ones that people might not necessarily know too much about, like Bibbo, like I just mentioned, is a, is a supporting major Superman character from the last, you know, 50, 60 years, if not longer. And, you know, most people probably don't know him. But then you'll have some that I know that gained prominence in other medias. Uh, like the adventures of a Superman TV show. I know that like Dan Turpin, uh, <laughs> who is one of the um, the police officers, you know, he is a semi-major recurring character in that. And yeah, he's in the comics. But when I say names like that, I think that people mostly remember like the Superman TV show or the JLA TV show, mm -hmm. things like that. And, you know, that's why I'm saying that this encompasses the entire spectrum of DC Comics. So, you know, those kind of little things that are not necessarily just for comic book readers, but people who have a passing knowledge of DC from various sources, whether they're TV shows, movies, maybe other games and things like that, video games. You know, we tried to put in what we thought that people would know, that they would look for, they would expect, and then also throw in those obscure things that like, oh man, I get that as a as a as a, you know, a true fan or reference. Oh, I don't want to say true fan. So <laughs> alienate people saying that. Well, so it, just to get this as the official soundbite here, because it sounds like what you're saying is that uh, the scope of DC's license expands well beyond the comics, including things like movies and TV shows. You know, how far back does this go? If it exists in DC Comics, then there's a potential to show up in the game. Now, of course, we wanted the primary focus to be the deceased line, and everything we do has to have you know permission from DC slash Warner Brothers on what they want to include and things like that. So, you know, uh, if something doesn't show up and it's like a major thing, then assuming that for whatever reason, you know, approvals, you know, came through and said, we want this or we don't want this, you know, those are always kind of at the whims of fate there. But, you know, Warner Brothers was fantastic to work with. Um, there was very few times we got any pushback on uh, anything we wanted to include. And usually it was just minor little things like that. Um, which I won't go into details just for the sake of, you know, professional interactions there. But uh, they were very good to work with, um, them and Spin Master, who was our basically liaison through that, uh, for getting what we wanted to include and basically keeping with the vision. There's uh, no major things that I can think of that we were just flat out told no. If they had a disagreement about something, usually it was like, okay, we don't necessarily want this, but we can do kind of a workaround here and maybe focus it in this way. Um, are there any favorite characters that you have that have maybe, or maybe have interesting interactions that you could highlight? 
Oh man, you're asking for spoilers just this early. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, just, you know. No, 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 no. You, you oh. asked, you asked. Okay, you're brave right. enough to ask. So that's how it works in that talk. case. Huh? It's a uh, I, let's talk about some <laughs> core box stuff. What is my okay. favorite character in the core box? Well, it's of course going to be one of the smartest and most pragmatic people in the entirety of the DC universe, uh, Lex Luthor. Oh. Um, the the living and the dead are your main separations in this world. So villains and heroes, that designation doesn't really exist too much when everyone's got to band together against the anti-life equation. And Lex Luthor is one of the playable heroes in the box. And I just love him because he's in his um, giant anti-Superman you know, suit. He's oh, actually sweet. one of the more durable characters in the core box because, you know, he, he built this... Technically, this is the... Okay, we're getting into some specifics here. This is technically <laughs> his apocalyptic... This is technically his apocalyptic technology version of his super suit, which is meant to, you know, take down Superman. So therefore, he actually is one of the more resilient superheroes in the box, him and alongside Wonder Woman. Uh, because, again, he's going up against, you know, the big blue boy scout himself, Superman. Uh, and he is not exactly um, in tears over the fact that he is having to take down zombified versions of, you know, his former adversaries. So, you know, he's got some powers that kind of reflect that and everything. Like, you know, oh, hey, look, I am proving my superior uh, dominance and authority here. So by taking down these big, important targets, I'm actually gaining buffs to myself and maybe helping out the team. But, you know, they're just the supporting cast, right? As Flash, he's now go run off this way, do whatever. As he's now maybe the smartest man on the planet or the second smartest, I forget what the line was, but he's one, a... of, one of my favorite <laughs> lines from the original DC's comic is they're in the Fortress of Solitude. And Lex Luthor is like, listen, you're listening to the smartest man in the... Hang on. We're sure Batman's dead, right? You're listening to the smartest man on the planet right now. That, that's, that's It was a fun property. So heroes and villains mixed together then, all fighting against the uh, the, the, the non-living, the uh, infected, the anti-life. Um, you had mentioned this earlier in uh, one of your Simon talks, Um you know, this tongue of balance, right? Where you're dealing with a wide range of characters, right? Um, and even in the deceased comic, right? They, there's some people that are hurt for maybe feeling like they, they weren't part of Batman's contingency plan or something. Like, they're maybe the lower end of the threat level. And then you have people like uh, Superman, right? And you're saying like, man, this is, you know, a pretty wide gap of power here. Um, you know, how do, what, what challenges does that make when trying to figure out like abilities and, and balancing game play while also making sure that it feels thematically right so the good news is that the biggest question typically comes to levels of power and durability you know your physical strength and then like how resilient you are luckily when you're dealing with something like the anti-life virus your resilience does kind of come into play um, and i'll get more to that in a second but like your physical resilience, it kind of balances out because if you're infected, it's kind of yes or no. Um, so like Superman gets infected by the Flash. Spoilers here, but why nope. are you listening? If that's <laughs> that's going to happen. And it, so it doesn't matter. It's the Man of Steel, but he still gets infected because it can happen. And once it's in, it's in. Now, that's the thing is that like in the DC setting, certain characters can be just straight up immune to the virus. It is not one of these, like, everyone and anything can be infected. They do have set rules. So non-organic guys typically cannot be infected. Like, a Cyborg is a carrier of the virus, but he himself is not does not succumb to it. And the thing is, is that as you start getting through the volumes and everything, those rules even kind of become a little fast and loose. Um... You know, like, uh, just the first thing that comes to my mind is that in one of the random later chapters, or I guess the books, Detective Chimp is talking about how animals can't be infected, which is kind of true most of the time, but sometimes it's like, what, where does that line go? So, you know, it's comics, they break their own rules. Like, one thing is like, um, so like Deathstroke the Terminator, you know, Slade Wilson, he, it the in the Unkillables volume, he starts... It starts by showing him getting infected, and then three days later, his own regeneration and um, healing factor kicked the virus out of his system, and he goes back to normal. So things like that can happen, and you know, so you have that balance about like physical resilience and strength, where usually if someone's going to get infected, okay, they're going to get taken down. So then that kind of covers the health thing. You've got some characters that are more resilient than others, which we have represented by your HP and everything. You know, between three and five, depending on who you are. As far as physical toughness. How do you balance a character, you know, like Batman going and doing his martial arts against undead 
versus someone like, you know, Lex Luthor in a power suit, okay? Substantially stronger. Or let's say Wonder Woman. That's the better comparison here. Wonder Woman can take down heavier foes, but Batman's bringing more utility to the team. Good. So Wonder Woman could be, you know, we could have made her as like a bruiser where she is just getting in the thick of things, taking down, you know, your big, super big threats. Meanwhile, Batman is planning things out. He is more strategically telling guys, hey, you go do this over here. I'm going to do this. You draw a heroic trait. You get some more equipment. And then you have the Flash who is, you know, we're not going to get into his <laughs> strength versus thing, but he's your speedster, okay? That's his whole thing. Is like he gets in and out of places. So it's catering to the expectations about like what does this character embody, and then really right. pushing them in that direction here. So that's, that, that's one of the the biggest ways about internally balancing things. Is like, okay, why am I playing the fat the Flash? Because got to go fast. So that's what I'm doing. I'm all based around movement. I'm not hitting guys necessarily the toughest. Wonder Woman's got that covered. I'm not necessarily giving boost to my allies here. Batman's taking that. And I'm not covering range support and egomania because Lex has that in spades. But I'm the guy who gets in a situation that no one else can just get in and out of. So if you're, uh, I mean, it sounds like you're really nailing the thematic component, right? And working that into zombie side. Um, for people who maybe aren't necessarily fans of the comics, right? They're just looking for another zombie side to jump in on that they like. Um, and maybe they're looking for this game for the first time. You know, sometimes it can seem like games can iterate and have new mechanics added in. What is maybe new about this version of zombie side that should maybe be a uh, make it a great one for jumping in with just like mechanics wise not even like putting the flavor aside for a second which i know is, like, <laughs> is very important but um what are maybe um yeah the new mechanics or elements that make this mechanically a, a new game to jump in with oh chase that is a very loaded and can be a potentially long-winded question <laughs> because there are so many micro changes that were made uh, to deceased versus any other zombie side. And there are, there are these little types of changes that are just quality of life. And I really feel will be overlooked by anyone who's just like coming into it fresh. But the ones who really look at these things, I feel there will be those moments where they're like, oh, you know, I, I almost feel like you have to point them out because they're going to be that smooth of a transition that unless we go through the entire list, and I'm willing to do that here with you, <laughs> or at least a big list, um, <laughs> that... You're, you're almost not going to notice them, but I think that those are the best type of quality of life improvements where they just make things better, but they don't necessarily call attention to themselves. So we can go through some of the major ones that come to my mind here, and I don't know how short or long this is going to go, but frankly, <laughs> um, just between you and I, Chase, this is going to be the section that just gets you your views of people pay attention because okay. this is this is going to be good. Um, With a deep breath. Side side. <laughs> okay, so off the cuff here, let's start thinking about some things. So bystanders. Um those are the guys that you will rescue across the map. Um, for many previous versions of the game where bystanders have appeared, we have modified how they actually function. And we took some cues from Zombieside 2nd Edition that they're um, basically they work like companions. You will find oh. them, you will get them, they will join your group and physically move with you on the board and just give you a little buff for them being in your base of your little, your little party. They can still jump in the way and get intercepted by attacks. So, you know, you'll have that moment where, you know, the, the hordes of zombies are coming and, you know, um, Jimmy Olsen decides, like, no, Superman, I've got to protect you. Well, not Superman because, you know, he's a zombie. <laughs> yeah. he, Batman, he I've got to protect Superman you. And, yeah. Exactly. But he can get taken down and that's bad. But it's a tactical decision. It creates that kind of tactical decision to sacrifice Jimmy Olsen. Sorry, but <laughs> sometimes uh, <laughs> you, know, you know that's the only way. Yep. Can I can I push on this a little bit? Is there? You said uh, make a group, make make your group. Um, yeah, so you can you actually like... rescue multiple bystanders and follow around the same hero, and they can like, okay, you guys go with Wonder Woman, you guys go with Flash, and so they have a physical presence on the board aside from potentially getting eaten by zombies. Um, but so the, you know you will see them. Uh, so like before in previous versions where there was bystanders, they would get rescued, they would go away, you would take their card. You're still going to get their card, but the miniature and with them are still going to stay with you and actually physically move around with you. Um, in addition to that, one of the new mechanics that's been added in is equipment. Um, this is not like items in previous zombie side. This is equipment are lo specific locations across the map, and they're very rare, almost to the same point of bystanders, but they are powerful pieces of gear they can be attacks they can be weapons they can be just stuff you find that your hero will equip and you can have one of them equipped at any time carry whatever you want but switch it out you know during your turn and you know they will give you different buffs or attacks so for example you know one of the ones we showed is the trident of poseidon you know uh, aquaman's you know 
key item there or whatnot. Um, now keep in note that yes, it is tied to Aquaman, but it is just something you will find, you know, because he's he drops it when he comes a zombie because, um, you know, the zombies are not intelligent. They have some retention of their powers, but they're not like strategic in any way. But like, okay, I might be going across the map as Wonder Woman or let's say Hawk Girl. I find the Trident Poseidon. Okay, that's a melee weapon that now I've got a melee attack that can I can use and gain these special effects for when I'm attacking with this thing specifically. It's got its own unique abilities. I might find something that is like, you know, a LexCorp repeller, so a little pistol that, you know, um, knocks everything back when I shoot them. Or a LexCorp energy blade, you know, so now I've got a melee attack that helps me slice through enemies. You know, the idea of the Flash having that, you know, just going <laughs> and cutting through things. Um, you might get like a personal force field that you find that helps you, you know, stave off attacks and things. Mm -hmm. These are things that you'll find across the map as you're exploring in buildings and things like that, along with the bystanders that you're trying to rescue. Um, one of the other quality of life changes that I would feel is we definitely wanted the zombie heroes when they show up to feel dynamic. So in, in this uh, version, they will always show up with a small cadre of other types of zombies as well. Because one of the oh, things is like previous ones, like, yes, they're tough on their own. Yeah. But sometimes it would be like, oh, no, you know, uh, Superman's showing up. He is a threat on his own. Right. And then like, oh, no, um, zombie, you know, uh, Catwoman is showing up. She is nasty, but on her own, it's kind of whatever. But, oh, she's showing up with, you know, runners or, you know, brutes with her right. as well. So some, cause sometimes it could be like a respite where you're like, oh, thank goodness a superhero showed up instead of, you know, a bunch of runners or... You because it's one threat versus ten. Yeah. And now you so don't no get the more. luxury. Okay. <laughs> if they show up, they're, they're <laughs> bringing guys with them. Now, that's actually something else to note there as well. And this is a little side thing here. Like I said, this this section can, can go. <laughs> is that the talk of, okay, well, and I did mention this in some previous design articles. Sometimes the zombies are not very exciting when it comes to deceased. Because, like, when Batman becomes a zombie... He's just a really fit guy who's now a zombie. You know, that's different than Superman becoming a zombie who still right. has all of his powers. You know, the thing that makes Batman Batman is his brain and his intelligence and his planning, all of which go right out the window when he gets zombified. So how do you make that a tangible threat if you're going to make a Batman zombie, for example? Well, you have to think about the psychological effects of Batman's now a zombie. If you're playing a superhero, a member of the Justice League, and you're going down the streets of Metropolis, and all of a sudden you see Batman running at you as a zombie, no, he's not the biggest threat. But think about the morale hit that the entire team has now taken. One of the greatest strategic minds on the planet, the guy who you know had a contingency plan for if everyone turns into zombies, is now not on your side anymore. That has effects. So that might, you know, hit you in some other ways, you know. Um, or it might cause, you know, it might cause you negatives in ways that are not just physical, you know, and things like that. Let's say Zombie Catwoman. Let's do a little bit of a spoiler here on her. Nope. Sometimes little key elements of personality can maintain. Okay, I'm not going to say like they're completely gone, but in 99% of the times they are. And this is something that's consistent slash inconsistent in the comics as well, because, hey, they're comics, but whatever. But like the way it was designing Zombie Catwoman, she still has a little bit of that like, you know, Catwoman in her so she actually goes after heroes that she prioritizes heroes that have equipment because uh, shiny um, you know yeah. that cat burglar element is still there for her you know so little things like that that show like you know yes they're 99 percent gone there's no chance that you would you know have an intelligent zombie here mm -hmm. past like oh i'm gonna break down this wall versus that wall but maybe just a little bit of their personality is still there not enough to really think but just enough to give them that little flavor of you know hey, that guy is still there, is still in there. Um, some other changes here, and let's think quality of life stuff here. Uh, so another element that's kind of changed for this is that there is player elimination in this version as well. In most previous zombie sides, you know, if you lose a single uh, player character, the game is over. Here, some scenarios might still uh -oh. have that as a baseline <laughs> rule, but um, usually most scenarios will say you have to reach the exit. If it's, like say, a scenario, just throwing out an example here reach the exit with, you know, um, four remaining superheroes out of your potential four through six that you'll have. And it scales based on players. Just like in some previous versions, the game here is based around four heroes, but can scale up to six. Okay. Um, so your scenario might say, 
uh, you know, make it to the exit zone with all remaining heroes. If two or more superheroes are eliminated, that's when you lose the game. So, you know, it's not going to be like down to the last man in some cases, but you do have those moments where a superhero can sacrifice themselves to reach a goal, or they might just get unlucky or something, and the game doesn't immediately end. And all the snares have been, you know, uh, balanced around that. So we don't want it to be a case where, like, you have six players and five of them have been eliminated, so right. only one's left. But you will get a couple times where it's like, oh, crap, you know, um, Green Canary had to go and sacrifice herself so everyone else could go and escape. That sucks, but it's not the end of the it's not the only <laughs> the end of the game. So That's you have cool. those moments that basically try to replicate rep, right. uh, try to replicate the comic book feel of like their the heroic sacrifice. Yeah, and those big time hero moments can still be there. That's awesome. Yeah, you get to be a hero. I I also worry that it means as a, on the design side, does that mean you don't have to pull punches because you're like, well, we can kill them and we can kill some and it's okay. It's funny you should mention that. I I have a little bit of a reputation for like make it harder because yeah. people like challenges, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the we actually have included a new difficulty level in this version of Zombie Side, uh -huh. and this is something as well that at the start of the scenarios, I've made this little section that basically goes over what to expect from the various difficulty levels of the game. Literally. So it starts off with easy. And the way I would describe this is that easy should encompass like your bottom 20% of your difficulty or so. You know, these are the ones that you just want a casual affair that like you'd really kind of have to go out of your way to really lose. That's where easy difficulty is going to follow. You know, that's like, yes. hey, we're all new to the game right. or we just want to create a cinematic fun right. time. This You're is playing with your kids, play. you know, yeah, yeah, exactly. Then we have medium. Medium should kind of make up like that next 70%. It's a big spectrum, but that's where the majority of your game should hit. Where, yeah, you're going to get a challenge. If you don't do anything stupid, you might be able to make a couple mistakes here, but you're not going to be overly punished for those things. And that's the majority of where your games are going to be. And then you have hard, which is going to be like the next little 10% above that, which is you guys should all know what you're doing. This should not really be for people who are new to the game. You should know kind of the, the the standard trappings. You know, don't stand on spawn points. Don't kick open the door of your last action. You know, well, you're, spoiler, past you're the just point bumping of... everybody into that. Into that. You, just, right. you gave out some pro tips there. You know? <laughs> this is the point where like you shouldn't be making your rookie mistakes. And if you do, the game is going to capitalize on that and punish you for it. And then we have my new addition, which is the upper 10% difficulty, which is called Nightmare. These are the ones where you better use every dirty tactic and cheesy combination that you can if you hope to actually try to win this one, okay? I think for the majority of players, that difficulty is going to be not so much we won, but how far did we get? And uh, I'm very happy to have included that because, um, hey, it's a challenge, right? Now, granted, there are not that many of those scenarios. The other thing is that, like, in the core box, um, we're aiming to have around 20 scenarios in that one, all unique, and, of course, various difficulties scaling up there. Um, but I have already designed, you know, I started at the top and we worked our way down. Like, okay, <laughs> um, you know, I wanted to make some one, like, really challenging ones. And these are ones that even our testers were just like, we had to create some cheese strategies to kind of win this one. And, you know, we had to really fundamentally know how to exploit everything we could in the game to come across and win these. But again, that's top 10%. That's yeah. for those challenges. Everything else, you know, should be doable for most people. And I'm sure there'll be people out there that when they play the Nightmare ones, they'll be like, this is too easy, make it harder. Good thing is Zombie Side is adjustable, so you can just change that to your tastes. Oh, this is gives you say, an ever-ending escalation, right? You dress up <laughs> like a bat, they, they dress up like that, you just raise the difficulty up there. No. Oh. Well, that sounds fantastic, and thank you so much for sharing all that. I'm, uh, I'm excited here. Um, I think can we can we as we start to wrap things up, can we end a little controversy here? Um, if you had to pick a favorite Batman besides Pete Holmes, who who would it be? <laughs> um, are we choosing just like comic I can book hear versions? The People, uh, it could be any. I hear the keyboards clashing already, so if it, I can't believe it. No, no pressure. Okay. No pressure. So I guess let's talk about comic book, like persona Ooh. Batman, and then just okay. overall Ooh. Batman. Okay. Um, I honestly believe that Ben Affleck was a good Batman, Ooh. specifically because I felt he balanced 
Bruce Wayne with Batman, and I know that's been an age-old conversation, is you either Oops. usually have a good Bruce Wayne or a good Batman. Right. And very few times does that cross over. Like, a George Clooney, he's got those sultry, dulcet tones, and he plays Bruce Wayne very well. Right. At least in my opinion. But I don't feel he made a very good Batman. <laughs> um, and then you have, like, Christian Bale, who you can have your opinions of and everything, but uh, <laughs> I liked his Batman. I didn't... I felt his Bruce Wayne was actually pretty good too. He's pretty high up there. Michael Swear Keaton. To me. That's... <laughs> I'm not wearing hockey pants. <laughs> um, Adam West was fun for what he was. <laughs> oh, that's true. That's true. Right. Yeah. We I he, do we do have to recognize like these are in their time as well. Um, he invented the bat tusi and then bat. Uh, sorry, bat repellent shark spray. Uh, hey. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um. But now, as far as like the actual versions in the game, now some minor spoilers, not in the game, but in the comics. Some minor spoilers here. Bruce Wayne as Batman does not have a long time in the comics. He, again, they, they kill him almost immediately. And Damian Wayne takes over as Batman. Um, I felt as the line progressed, Damian really came into his own there. It's very hard to beat Bruce Wayne um, as Batman. I know that... Uh, and yes, you have like other versions as well, like Tim Drake, you know, took over as him for a bit. Um, you had, you know, Asriel as Batman, which was more of the like kind of edgy ones. That was a neat concept, but you know, execution. It's just, I think you have to go with the classic Bruce Wayne, you know, as a, as Batman. As far as the era, I see. I grew up on like the Batman, the animated series. To me, <laughs> that um, Kevin Conroy is that's the voice of Batman, him and yeah. Mark Hamill, those are the Batman and the Joker to me. So that's always when I think like, okay, what would Batman do? That's the version I think of. And I'm sure everyone has their own version as well that, you know, that's what they come back to. Yeah. Well, let us know in the comments below if Michael got it right. And what's what's your favorite? Let us know what your favorite Batman is. And uh, actually, yeah, because that recent one, The Batman, I went in with low expectations. And uh, Robert Pattinson for me... I, it was it was better than I thought it was going to be. So that was uh, one I was kind of surprised by. I was going to mention that, but Chase, to be honest, the reason I didn't is I couldn't remember the actor's name. Oh, there <laughs> I we go. I feel okay. bad about that. But yeah, it was yeah. a good performance. That was definitely a um, a detective style Batman, and I appreciate yeah. it. it. Definitely gave me a lot of like year one vibes, which is what they were going for, and that worked out really well. I think that that was just a really long movie for me. That was my only <laughs> issue with it. Fair, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, well, like I said, let us know in the comments below uh, what your favorite Batman is, and then any other questions you have about Deceased coming up. And uh, we're really excited for this one. Excited for the Kickstarter. Michael, when is the Kickstarter launching? It is launching on November 14th at, uh, I believe, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. All right, perfect. Uh, so we'll be we'll eagerly waiting for that to drop, and we look forward to more of your designer diaries. Uh, thanks so much for coming on. Yep, anytime, Chase, and we want to have any follow-ups or anything here, feel free. Sweet, all right, okay, and I'm excited to get to do some more uh, zombie side videos here, so uh, folks, stay tuned for that, and in the meantime, we hope we get your miniatures on the table. <laughs>